والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم بسم الله الحمد لله You're watching the beauties of Islam And I'm Yusuf Estes And today we've got a special program for you Talking about the beauties of Islam in the past, we've discussed the Qur'an, the teachings of Muhammad, and the preservation of the teachings of the scholars of Islam. Now what I'd like to do is talk about some of the history of the universities and the great centers of learning that came about and how they were also preserved. You might be surprised to learn that one of the oldest universities for Islam in the world is in a place called Cairo, Egypt. It was founded more than a thousand years ago during the Fatimid time, and in that very university was the first ever to have a woman as the rector. She was the dean of the whole entire university, a woman, teacher, scholar of Islam. Amazing? Hmm. There's a lot of amazing and beautiful things in Islam. This university is even open today. And if anybody would like to go to that university, they can put their children in there from from first grade, primary school, and take them all the way through high school, and they will memorize the entire Quran and learn so many of the Hadiths and have the Arabic language. Then they can continue their studies and go on to learn more and learn about the Quran. How does it come and how are the verses in context and how do we understand these things? Along with the Hadiths and teachings of Muhammad, something called fiqh is also explained and taught there in that uh, school in that university and thick is something like uh, maybe in English schools of jurisprudence when I visited Al-Azhar I was shown a place where they used to have all four schools represented outside it was really cool they would sit outside and they had their places where they would sit and their teachers would teach them and they were all within just a hand reach of each other if they would like to go over and share any information back and forth it was very easy for them to do so of course, now with air conditioning, you wouldn't want to sit out inside and do that anymore. But back then, you see, that was really something. This teaching has continued on along with the teaching of what's called the Sira or the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Talking about his life from the time he was born, the time that revelation came to him, his contact with non-Muslims and their relationships, his migration to Medina, then the development of the full Islam as it comes, the companions and their stories, and then up to his death. Peace and blessings be upon him. This is all called Sirah, or the biography of the prophet, peace be upon him. There are other things like, for instance, how to pronounce the words from the Quran called Tajweed, carefully being able to say it exactly as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said it, and as he approved of, this, of the pronunciations of his various companions. There are some different pronunciations that he permitted on certain words, and even this is known and taught at this great university called Al-Azhar. I had the good fortune to also visit another university while I was visiting in Maghreb, or Morocco, and while I was there, they took me to a place called Fes. And when I saw the way that they had preserved this whole community, the whole setting there was as though I was on a movie set. When I went in through the walls and saw how they had everything there, they even still had camels and donkeys and people selling in the streets, the little awnings that come out, the people even dressed in their traditional dress. It was an amazing sight, and I was very taken with that. Then I got to go to the university that they have there, and this university is even older than Al-Azhar. And the books, the library that they have there, so fantastic to realize that they have been memorizing and teaching and teaching and memorizing and passing this on for so many generations. It was so amazing and beautiful. And all I could think about was I wish I had more time. I would love to enroll and go to this university. It would just be great. I did have a chance to visit with the scholars and teachers there. I found them to be very knowledgeable, impressive, humble, and lovely in their way of delivering and talking, you know. 
There are other places that you can find that they've been teaching Islam consistently and steadily in Mauritania, in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, of course, Medina and Mecca, in Kuwait. An amazing place, too, is to consider the teachings that they have going on now, even now in, a, in Europe, in Turkey. Because, you see, Turkey's been a part of the Islamic empire for centuries upon centuries upon centuries, maybe since the 1400s. And they've had these centers for learning. And again, I emphasize that the teaching and the preservation has always been exactly the same. That it's, first of all, mouth to ear, so that you know what you're saying from memory. The Quran is memorized in the Arabic language, the classical Arabic language, and then the teachings of Muhammad called Hadith are also memorized the same way. Now, you might be surprised to find that some of the characters are written differently when you write it down, but they're pronounced exactly the same. This is true if you compare, for instance, if you go to Maghrib, Morocco, and compare it to what you find in Saudi Arabia or even in Egypt. Because, for instance, the letter called Fa has one dot over the top of it. But in Maghreb, in the Quran, they use the one dot on top to be the letter Qaf. Ah. And when they want Fa, they put the dot below it. You might say, aha, there's a discrepancy. Oh, I heard that maybe somebody said there could be different Qurans. All right. <laughs> That's why we want to bring this subject up. Did you know that there's something about this that a lot of Muslims don't even know. And we're going to talk to you about it as soon as we come back from the break. So don't go away. You're going to want to hear about the different writings of the Quran. Be right back after this. Inshallah. Islam is keeping up the pace. Islam is for every race. Brothers and sisters, to increase your iman. من تعلم القرآن وعلمه ورتل القرآن ترتيلا Learning how to recite the Quran properly Learning the meaning of what we recite Concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite Trying to implement what we learn in our daily life Would we'll listen to the participants and the guests We'll take your phone calls We're going to recite life We'll listen to your recitation and we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which will state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. <laughs> We're back and you're watching the beauties of Islam and we've been talking about preservation of the information of Islam. We've been talking about the universities, the institutes, schools of learning. And then just before we went to break, I decided to give you a little taste of something to keep your curiosity piqued. And that was a subject about the different writings in the Quran. And how could it be that there are different Qurans? Well, in fact, you can go to the museums where the Quran is still preserved today. And what I'm talking about here, the, it's preserved two ways. When I was visiting in Istanbul in the Top Copy Museum, which is uh, uh, really now set up as a museum, but it used to be a part of the, uh, the Khalif's compound. It was a very beautiful setup that he had. And now they have uh, such things on display as the swords that were used by the companions and uh, uh, different clothing and articles and uh, headgear and so on. It's all preserved there. One of the things they have is the text of the Quran written out by hand, of course. It's long before printing presses. And you look at it and you'll say, wait a minute, that's not Arabic. I know Arabic. It doesn't look like Arabic. What is this? Well, they have the same thing exactly if you go to the museum, which is located in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. This is the home of the great imams, such as Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Imam Termidi, and many more. Now, in that place, you will find the Quran written there on, on exhibition. 
but you're going to say the same thing. This doesn't look like Arabic. And if you go to England, to the museum there, you're going to see again, this doesn't look like Arabic. The reason is because at the time of the revelation of the Quran, none of the Arabs used any tashkil marks, and it was assumed that if you could read and write in Arabic, you knew how the structure of the sentences and words were, that you would be able to pronounce it. You see, there are no vowels in Arabic. This is also true of the Hebrew language of the Bible. There are no vowels. These were added much later, the, what's called vowel markings. And then you substitute different consonants to represent vowels. Kind of like in English, the word try, T-R-Y, the vowel is the consonant Y. And so in the same way in Arabic, you would find the ya sound used to pronounce the sound of A, like the word bait has that uh, ya used to be, represent the, the vowel. But for those who are not familiar with the structure of language, they wouldn't be able to do that. They might pronounce it wrong. And this is not acceptable for Quran. It might be for Hadith and teachings of, you know, just Arabic itself and talking about stories. But when we're going to talk about the Quran, it has to be exact. So how can we do that? How we preserve it? Well, what they did, they used marks. They put these dots so that if you saw a round circle, you could quickly tell the difference without knowing the size of the circle, how it compares to another circle with a bigger tail on it and so on. They would just put one dot above, which was the sound of fa, like in fan, or two dots for the sound of cough, like in uh, uh, qu, that we use in English, don't have it in Arabic uh, in English, but... Each one of these, like a dot below the line, would be a ba, like in bait. A dot above would be noon, the sound of n. And then two dots, ta. All of this was added. It was not in the Quran in the, in the time of the companions because they didn't have it in the language yet. It wasn't there. It came in the next generation. So in the 7th century is about the time that the Muslims began to add what's called the tashkil, the harakat to these letters. Now, it was after that that the Jewish Maseratis began to add their tashkil to their text, and that's why it's called the Maserati text. Prior to that time, they also had none of these markings. Another thing that they did was to put something over and below the letters so you knew to pronounce it with the sound of ah and e and u. Otherwise, again, I'll repeat to you, there are no vowels in the Arabic language. So this is how they made it for the non-Arabs, made it easy for them to begin to correctly pronounce and teach and memorize the Quran. That's why you find these differences. However, when you hear the Quran recited, you'll agree as many millions have over the centuries, there really is no different. Whether I hear it, recited in Al-Azhar University in Cairo, or if I hear it in Fes, in Morocco, or if I hear it recited in Istanbul, in Turkey, or if it's recited in Malaysia, or Indonesia, Pakistan, India, or even in a place called Texas, where I'm from, you'll find it still starts with a ba in Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and it ends with the scene at the very end of the Quran, Min al -Jinati. One nas. All of this is preserved exactly letter for letter, word for word. And it's because of the efforts of these great and wonderful teachers of Islam and their universities and institutions that have been going on century upon century. Today we have these places of learning, madrasas and the mosques or masajid around the world, and also these Jemia or universities. All of them are there for anyone to go and learn. And by the way, you don't have to be a Muslim to learn about Islam. You're most welcome to come explore and enjoy the beauties of Islam. Remember to visit our website, beautiesofislam.com. Until next time, peace. Salaam alaikum. Islam is peace. Islam.